My name is John Brown, and on behalf of the Streatham Society, I would like to welcome you to this presentation on Streatham's 41. To commemorate the 75th anniversary of the V1 campaign against Britain in the Second World War, the Streatham Society has produced a third edition of our publication, Streatham's 41. This tells the story of the 41 V1 bombs that fell on the town between June and August 1944. This anniversary is likely to be the last major occasion when the event will remain in the living memory of residents of our suburb. The vast majority of adults who lived through those harrowing days have now sadly died and the occasion is now chiefly recalled as teenage and childhood memories of our oldest inhabitants. On the 3rd of September 1939, Streatham residents huddled around their radios to hear that emotive broadcast by the then Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, advising that yet, once again, Britain was at war with Germany. I am speaking to you from the Cabinet Room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Rather than experiencing an immediate onslaught by German forces, Britain bathed in the warmth of an Indian summer as it entered a period now known as the Phony War. However, within eight months, the war became anything other than phony, as Poland was occupied by the Nazis and German troops invaded Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland and France. Chamberlain was swept from office and the new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, found himself in the midst of the greatest crisis to face this country since the First World War. Our army was trapped in France and there appeared to be little anyone could do to stop the Germans marching through Europe, laying captive to all they conquered. The miracle of the evacuation of Dunkirk in early June 1940 was quickly overshadowed a fortnight later by the fall of France, with German troops marching through the Arc de Triomphe and the swastika flag flying from the Eiffel Tower in the very heart of Paris. Within three months, the war was being fought over the skies of England as a gallant few combated the might of the German Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain. Although we won that battle, our prize was to be a winter of incessant bombing as the Blitz destroyed huge swathes of London. The front line was now no longer in some far-off corner of Europe, but here on the streets of Streatham, as death and destruction rained down on our town from the belly of German bombers. As local residents sought refuge in their air raid shelters at the bottom of their gardens, they can be forgiven for maybe thinking that the first year of the war had turned against them, and few, if any, could have anticipated that another four years of desperate conflict lay ahead before the dream of victory could begin to be realised. 
But in the opening months of 1944, such optimism would not have been misplaced. Rommel had been defeated in North Africa. The Battle of the Atlantic against the German U-boats had been won and Allied troops were marching victoriously through the streets of Rome. Then on June the 6th, 1944, the news everyone had been waiting for. At last, D-Day had arrived and the largest amphibious operation in the history of the world had landed troops on the beaches of Normandy and the invasion of Western Europe had begun. As Streatham residents read in their papers that Allied armies had gained a toehold on the continent of Europe, they must have looked forward with growing confidence that the war may soon be over and their hardships relieved. During the following week, the Streatham churches embarked on a major religion and life festival, with a rally on Streatham Common attended by over 4,000 local residents. A week after D-Day, on Tuesday the 13th of June, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr William Temple, visited our town to preach at Streatham's ancient parish church of St Leonard's as part of the Religion and Life Festival. Many who attended that service must have returned home with their optimism for the future reinforced. However, three days later, at 2am on the morning of the 16th of June, the first V1 bomb fell on Streatham, destroying the former Empire Cinema, which at that time was being used as an emergency food store. The V-1 was a pilotless bomb and was called the V-1 as it was the first of Hitler's vengeance weapons. This new and terrifying bomb reignited frightening memories of Streatham's experiences during the Blitz and once again brought death, devastation and destruction to the area. From the explosion of the first V-1 in Streatham to the last, which fell two months later in the early hours of the 13th of August in Crowborough Road, a total of 41 doodlebugs landed on our town. When Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of the Third Reich in 1933, he set about building up his armed forces and developing a range of new and terrifying weapons. By 1937, the small fishing village of Punamunda on the Baltic coast was developed as a research station and became the main centre for the testing of Hitler's new technological weapons. By December 1942, manufactured prototypes of the V-1 rocket were being rigorously tested. Alongside this project, another rocket design was undergoing development, the V-2. This was a long-range weapon that was destined to become the world's first guided ballistic missile. By the 27th of June 1943, Major problems with the V-1 had been overcome and it achieved a flight of 234 kilometres. The next day, Hitler ordered the construction of four massive bunkers in northern France from which the bombs could be launched on Britain. In London, intelligence from spies and photo reconnaissance soon alerted the authorities of the threat posed by Hitler's new secret weapons. It is at this stage that we introduce to our story a man who was to play a prominent role in Streatham after the war, Duncan Sandys, who was to become Streatham's Member of Parliament 
from 1950 to 1974. He was married to Winston Churchill's daughter, Diana, and from 1935 was the Member of Parliament for Norwood. He had been the commander of Britain's first experimental anti-aircraft rocket unit, but was invalided out of the forces after a motor accident. He returned to the Commons, where he was made Minister Responsible for Weapons Research and Development. It was because of this background Churchill appointed him to investigate the possible threat posed by Germany's secret rocket programmes. Verification of German rocket activity was confirmed with photographs taken on the 12th of June 1943 by a Mosquito aircraft from 540 Squadron. Rockets could be clearly seen on trailers at Pinamunda. Fifteen days later, Sandys had sufficient evidence to report to the War Cabinet. On the night of the 17th and 18th of August 1943, 600 planes of Bomber Command under Operation Hydra bombed the installations at Pinamunda. Much damage was done, but most of the casualties were amongst the foreign labourers conscripted to work at the site, rather than the German technicians. Pinamunda West, where the V-1 test flying programme was undertaken, remained unscathed. Although much of the plant was salvageable, the Germans decided to move operations to Nordenhausen in the Hertz Mountains, which was better protected. The work thus continued, but the bombing had set it back. In November, Sandy's responsibilities were transferred to the Deputy Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal N. H. Bottomley, but he remained as an advisor on rockets. In December 1943, the Crossbow Committee was formed to coordinate countermeasures to the threat which was still undetermined. Air reconnaissance revealed a number of strange constructions in northern France. Nicknamed ski sites, they were long and straight except for a curve at one end. Ominously, they all pointed towards London. Senior officials in the ARP and the Royal Observer Corps were quietly informed to keep an eye open for strange flying objects, but for the rest of the population there was a blissful ignorance. As Bomber Command sought to destroy the ski sites, the Germans developed a mobile launch system for their V-1 and V-2 rockets to overcome the threat from Allied bombers. Meanwhile, Hitler became increasingly impatient at the delays in bringing the weapons into operation and ordered that England should be attacked by the combined use of V-1s, bombers and long-range guns. The bombardment would open like a thunderclap on his birthday, the 20th of April 1944. However, Allied bombing and technical problems delayed the thunderstorm Hitler had planned. As a consequence, D-Day preparations and the Allied Armada's launch on the 6th of June were not hampered by Hitler's new vengeance weapons. However, the authorities were aware of the impending threat they posed and behind the scenes, frantic operations were taking place to deal with them. It is interesting to note that on the 7th of June, the day after the D-Day landings, Streatham's senior district warden, Kenneth Bryant, sent a message to all ARP wardens in the Streatham division. In part, it read, The long-awaited invasion of Western Europe is on, and a grand initial success achieved. 
But the Prime Minister solemnly warns us against premature optimism. We in London have recently enjoyed a long sequence of alert free nights. May it continue. But let us heed and apply Mr Churchill's warning to our own job of civil defence. For myself I cannot believe, much as I would like to, that we shall have no further air raids on Streatham. Let us therefore maintain our preparations in good shape. Let every form of training go forward with increased rather than diminished zeal, so that whatever may lie ahead we shall discharge our responsibilities to the utmost of our capacity. Bryant's warning was well timed. Overwhelmed by the Allied might, the Germans slowly retreated from the Normandy coast, and although not fully ready, they were forced to launch the first of their vengeance weapons prematurely. On the morning of Tuesday the 13th of June, some ten flying bombs were catapulted towards London. Half of these crashed immediately. Another fell into the sea, but the remaining four continued northwards. In England, two Royal Observer Corps observers at a Mortello tower at Dimchurch were quick to realise the strange sounding aircraft with a glowing tail that was rapidly approaching them was the predicted German secret weapon that they had been warned about and they triggered the diver code word to alert the British defence systems. At 4.13am the first V1 crashed in a field near Swanscombe. Two others fell harmlessly but the third of the quartet hit a railway bridge in Bethnal Green. 30 people were injured and six killed. The slaughter had begun. Two days later, at midday on the 15th of June, some 200 bombs were launched from France during a 24-hour period, of which 60 got through to London. One of these was destined to land in Streatham, when the first V1 to hit our town crashed into the former Empire Cinema by Streatham Station at 2am on the morning of the 16th of June. Fortunately, there were no fatalities, but the extent of destruction was extensive. At this time, even the authorities were unsure what they were dealing with, and in the early days of the offensive, ministers and military personnel attended each site hoping to salvage clues concerning this new and frightening weapon. Hence we have this famous photograph, taken at Streatham, of a policeman gathering up fragments of the bomb which were taken away for detailed study by government scientists. However, as more bombs crashed or flew overhead, the nature of the weapon became common knowledge to military and civilians alike. Flying almost in a straight line, the V-1 made a relatively easy target. Anti-aircraft guns were able to account for many, especially when proximity fuses were added to the shells. Many of the faster fighter planes, including the newly introduced jet-propelled Meteors, were able to attack the flying bombs without reprisal, provided the pilot disengaged before the warhead exploded. The problem of ACAC and fighters operating in the same airspace was soon apparent, and in mid-July, in a matter of a few days, nearly 1,000 guns were transported from all over the country to the Channel Coast, leaving the skies overland free for purely aircraft attacks, with fighters also patrolling over the open seas. Barrage balloons increased threefold during July and some hundreds of V1s were brought down as the wings snagged their cables. 
With this combination of defensive measures, ultimately some 40% of the doodlebugs were destroyed before they ever reached London. Despite the Allied bombing of the launching sites, the Germans were able to keep up a more or less continuous barrage. A good crew could send a V1 racing up the ramp every 30 minutes, and sites averaged some 15 missiles daily, regardless of the weather, day and night. Tower Bridge was the aiming point, but any near miss within five miles was certain to find a target. The route to London, over Sussex and Kent, was to become known as Doodlebug Alley, and the landscape was potmarked by missiles brought down by the defences. Almost as many V1s crashed through malfunction, but behind the statistics lie the enormity of the terror. Of the 9,251 bombs that crossed the coast, some 60% fell on land, and nearly half of these in the densely built-up London region. On crashing to earth at the end of its 25-minute flight, the warhead exploded with terrific devastation. In a densely built-up area, some dozen houses could be totally obliterated and the blast could affect as many as a thousand neighbouring homes to a greater or lesser degree. Much of the peripheral damage was confined to roofs and windows, where slates were stripped off and glass disintegrated. Indeed, most injuries were caused by flying glass. People soon appreciated the inherent warning given by the machine itself with the characteristic drone being sufficient to announce its presence. But as the bomb nosed downwards to its destruction, the engine cut out. During the few seconds of silence was the time to scramble under any available cover. The last V1 to fall on Streatham was on the 13th of August 1944 at Fursdown. As the Allies overrun the French sites, the campaign gradually finished. Elsewhere, there were a few incidents of V1s launched over the North Sea from Heinkel bombers. However, London was soon to be targeted by the V2 rockets. These had a longer range, being easier to camouflage and easier to transport. These rockets were to prove a greater menace. Whilst the warhead was only marginally larger than that of the V1, the real terror of this weapon was the inability to defend against it. All conventional anti-aircraft defence was useless. With the missile travelling faster than the speed of sound, there was no warning. It announced itself by the sudden explosion on impact. The V2 campaign commenced on the 8th of September. Altogether, there were 1,115 incidents in England, nearly half of which fell on London. Streatham was fortunately spared this onslaught. The nearest V2 falling on Tootingbeck Common on the 5th of November. It has to be remembered there was, of course, complete censorship about the raids. Newspaper reports spoke merely of events somewhere in southern England. It was not desirable for the launching crews to know their weapons were reaching the targets. Through a famous German double agent, Eddie Chapman, 
Reports were fed back to the German High Command to give the impression the V1s were overshooting central London. As a result, the less densely populated areas of South London suffered the brunt of the V1s, with the boroughs of Croydon receiving 142 bombs, Wandsworth 122, Lewisham 114, Camberwell 81 and Lambeth 72. These boroughs were the worst affected in London. Of the 5,208 flying bombs that evaded the anti-aircraft defences, 2,419 reached the Greater London area. They caused a casualty rate higher than that experienced during the Blitz in 1940 and 1941. However, this was because many more were injured, especially by flying glass, and the total of deaths at 5,122 was actually lower than that recorded in the Blitz. Streatham, with its share of 41 bombs, had casualties listed as 986, of which 335 were seriously injured and 567 slightly injured. Some injured were to die later and no doubt many others' lives were shortened. The 84 deaths, as given at the time, give a rate of two per bomb, just below the London average. But most of the bombs did not claim deaths, only 22 doing so, the highest single instance being 12 fatalities by bomb number 35, which fell on Pendle Road. In addition, the combined damage done to property in Streatham by bombing during the Blitz and the V1 campaign resulted in an estimated 88% of buildings in the area being damaged. Some were completely destroyed, but most suffered serious blast damage with tiles lifted from roofs, windows blown in and ceilings collapsing. Today, the tell-tale signs of bomb damage can still be seen throughout Streatham, where a terrace of Victorian or Edwardian houses are suddenly interrupted by a 1950s building erected on an old bomb site after the war. This is evident in the very heart of Streatham, where, opposite St Leonard's Church at the junction of Glen Eldon Road, one can see a plain 1950s building at the top of a row of small Regency cottages which were subsequently converted into shops. This marks the site where a bomb fell on the 10th of November 1940. And again here, where advertising hoardings now occupy the site of buildings demolished by V1 bomb number 23, which fell opposite in the grounds of the War Memorial Gardens at 2pm on the afternoon of the 5th of July, 1944. However, some of the devastation caused by the V1s has vanished beyond trace, such as here at the junction of Sherwood Avenue and Glenister Park Road, where V1 bomb number 13 fell at 7pm on the evening of the 29th of June. The houses here were around 15 years old at the time of their destruction and were rebuilt after the war to their original designs, so the visual impact of the damage caused is now indiscernible. My grandmother lived here at 73 Colmer Road and 15 years after the war when as a young boy I would visit her, the windows of the house rattled when the wind blew, as they were still held in place with panel pins. 
The ceilings of the upstairs room consisted of hardboard nailed to the rafters with battens. Throughout the 1950s, my grandmother was still waiting for the landlord to repair this wartime damage to her home, which sadly never happened during her lifetime, and she just got used to it. The London County Council maintained detailed bomb damage maps for the whole of London, with houses damaged colour-coded on the map. The darker the colour, the more serious the damage, with houses coloured black being completely destroyed and those shaded in yellow suffering just minor blast damage. These maps can be viewed today on the internet and have been published in book form by the London Topographical Society. So, with the launch of the Streatham Society's latest publication, Streatham's 41, which commemorates the 75th anniversary of the V1 campaign against Britain in the Second World War, we tell again the story of the 41 V1 bombs that fell on the town in the summer of 1944. The book is based on Kenneth Bryant's booklet, published on the 16th of March 1945. It had an initial print run of 5,000 copies, which cost a shilling each. The first print run was sold out within 30 hours of publication. Kenneth was Streatham's senior district ARP warden between 1942 and 1945, and was awarded the British Empire Medal for his services to the ARP and the people of Streatham during the war. The Streatham Society's reprint augments Kenneth's booklet with detailed background information provided by John Creswell, Bob Jenner and Colin Crocker. The text is superbly illustrated by the detailed maps of each bombing prepared by John Creswell, who was a talented and gifted illustrator. The layout and production of the book was very much John's work and is a fitting testimony of the skill and expertise he brought to producing publications for the Streatham Society. For many years John was the secretary of the Streatham Society and he worked tirelessly for the benefit of our town. During his time in Streatham he helped establish many events which subsequently developed into annual occasions which are still held and enjoyed today. He was the prime motivating force behind the creation of the Streatham Arts Festival in the mid-1990s, which later led to the formation of the Streatham Festival. He also conceived and helped organise the first Streatham Wind Day on Streatham Common in 1998, which now continues as the very successful annual Streatham Kite Day. For over 20 years, John played an active role in helping make Streatham a better place in which to live, work and relax. Following his retirement in 1999, he moved back to his hometown of Bournemouth, where he also made a valuable contribution to the life of that community. John died in 2019, aged 79 and this third edition of Streatham's 41 is dedicated to his memory. The book costs £8 and is available from the Streatham Society bookstall and via our website or by mail at a cost of £10 and 10 pence, including post and packing, with orders being sent to the Streatham Society, 316 Green Lane, Streatham, London, SW16 3AS. Cheques should be made payable to the Streatham Society. Thank you. We hope you have found this presentation on Streatham's 41 of interest. <laughs>